Good morning. So our first scripture today is Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up swords against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Okay, and the next one is Matthew 24, 36 through 44. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Good morning. Happy New Year to you. Every liturgical year, I start my sermon with this greeting. This is a new year in terms of liturgical year. We are entering a new liturgical year with Advent, which lasts for four Sundays and finishes with Christmas. Advent is, the meaning of the Advent is is, is that the name came from Latin word, Advent, Adventus which means coming, which also uh, came from the Greek word, parousia. So Advent is a time of uh, celebration of nativity of Jesus at Christmas, but it also involves the, uh, the expectant wait, waiting of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad today to see youth participation in our worship today. Uh, They are not just passively silent, but they are actively listening and participating. Somebody said, listen and silent are spelled with the same letters, but the attitudes are totally different. You can have silent or listen. As we always do, we will greet with with one another, but this time I would like to... uh, I, I would like you to uh, welcome all our youth around you and greet them and celebrate our advent together. Let's arise and share our love in Jesus Christ. My, my sermon will be short today because we have a lot of stuff to go through. But as always, I will start with a joke. A man, a, man take, a man took a taxi and said to the driver, Please hurry. I need to get to the airport as soon as I can. Easy, sir. Why are you, why are you so hurry? Replied the driver. The man said, I'm, I'm going to be late for the flight. Now drive faster, please. What flight are you on, then? The driver kept asking. 
the Delta 696. Now please be quiet, drive as fast as you can. The man replied angrily, Sir, don't worry, I was at the airport 30 minutes ago and heard, uh, that, uh, heard the announcement that the flight 696 would be delayed until further, further notice, the driver said. And the man replied, Yes, because I'm the pilot of the fly, flight. It is a busy travel season right now. In fact, today, today is the busiest, uh, busiest air travel day ever in American history. 3.1 million people travel today. New record in U.S. history according to the fl flight tracking services. I assume many travelers will, travelers will have nightmare experiences. And if I ask you to share your, your stories about flight nightmare, then we will have to spend over, overnight tonight, right? Many Christians correctly understand that the advent, the coming of Christ, is not just about the birth of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago. Coming also means the return of Jesus Christ in splendorous glory in the future. However, as his coming has been delayed for not one year, not 10 years, nor 100 years, but almost 2,000 years, many non-believers have criticized the church for still believing in such an absurd story like the coming of the Messiah or the final judgment. What do you think about their criticism? If we feel, if we feel several hours of flight delay as unbearable or nightmare, how do we Christians still believe in the coming of Jesus after 2,000 years? I guess the answer might be related to the themes of Advent. The four themes of Advent are, are hope, peace, joy, and love. Today the theme is hope. This, time, this theme explains why we don't take Advent as just a past experience, past event. Advent is more about what we need to need, what we need in our current life and our future on the basis of the proof of the past. So why do we still have the same hope as, as, as the Christians 2,000 years ago, the coming of the Messiah? Why do we not call it a false promise or, or a broken, broken dream? The answer is that the first coming of Jesus was not just an historical event in the past. It is the beginning of God's great plan to save humanity from the power of the devil, from the power of death. If you consider the birth of Jesus as a separate event in the past and the coming of the Messiah as another separate event in the future, you don't understand the time in between. In the birth of Jesus Christ, Jesus reminded Joseph of what the prophet Isaiah said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The birth of Jesus was the proof of God being with us. God never left us since the coming of the Messiah. So it's the continua continuation of what God already started. Even after Jesus was resurrected and res ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came to us to reside in us. Jesus called his disciples in the beginning of his ministry. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gave the great comm commission to the disciples by saying, Therefore, go and make disciples. So Jesus himself made disciples, 
but also commanded his disciples to make another disciples. Then we can read the book of Acts and see how his commandment was accomplished by his disciples and other faithful believers until even now. The ministry of Jesus, healing, caring, and loving the most ignored people in the world, have continued since then for 2,000 years by so many faithful Christians in the world. Many Christians have fought for God's justice and have been persecuted by human authorities like Jesus. Many Christians have proclaimed the good news of Jesus worldwide and coming of the Messiah as the king and the judge of the world. So what Jesus started as his ministry has continued until now. This is the meaning of in-between time, the birth of Jesus and the coming of the Messiah. Our hope is grounded on both what Jesus has done for us 2,000 years ago and what God promised to bring in the future. The end time has already begun. The new creation and new transformation of God has already begun. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. God's work of salvation begun and, and has continued until now. Many people understand hope as desired for things out of their, their reach. When we set a goal to get a thing or to achieve an ambition, we don't call it a hope. It is our goal or intent, but not a hope. Sometimes people think it is okay to use the word hope as an empty word as far as we are encouraged by it. Sometimes we feel like we are chasing rainbows in the name of hope. However, hope in the Bible is not an empty word. God proved it through the coming of the Messiah. God still proves it through the Holy Spirit, enabling the ministries of Jesus to continue. God will ultimately substantialize the hope in the second coming of the, of the Son of God. In today's passage, Matthew chapter 24, we are able to read about the people who had, had all kind of, kind of hope. Matthew 25, 30, 24, 38 introduces the, how the people in the time of Noah behaved in ways in which they didn't presume any imminent uh, destruction by God. They were eating and drinking. They were going to school and having vacations. They were playing games and watching movies. They were marrying and celebrating their accomplishments. Of course, I paraphrase the verse a little bit. But they were doing as a normal life. What would hope look like if people think nothing serious will happen in the future? For them, the definition of a hope is to see things happening in their ways and in their times. If you read the story of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, it was exactly why God dis decided to destroy the people in the time of Noah, except for Noah's family, because they, they reached a point that their life goals were to gain whatever they wanted, even though it meant to devastate their relationships with God and with their neighbors. In summary, this is all kind of hope that is to satisfy our desires, even as at the cost of broken relationship with God and with others. However, many people don't realize that their hope is a different side of the same coin called 
fear. A lot of cases, people's hope is the other side of the same coin called fear. A psych- psychologist Neil Burton said, inherent in every hope is a fear, and in every fear is a hope. At a deeper, deeper level, hope means to expect our present, present time may be different from our past, and our, our future may be different from our present. This kind of hope reflects our fear in a deeper level. In this kind of hope, we tend to set up our goals to reduce our fear. All our goals are like to go to a better college, to have a better job, to, to get married, to have a more luxurious vacation. All of this kind of list reflect that we have we, we, we want to be relieved from the fear of uncertainty. Our focus is to get a better res- resume and a better position. However, when we find our life is stuck, isolated, or not very successful, we consider our life meaningless and hopeless. This is the character of our hope, old hope. However, Jesus has brought a new and different kind of hope. This hope focuses on on the presence of God in ourselves. This hope focuses on God's vindication of our life and on the ultimate victory, ultimate victory of Christian life. To summarize the difference between the old and and new hope, our old hope focuses on what we become. It focuses on what we become. Like lawyers, doctors, engineers, CEOs, successful businessmen, or better titles of whatever. That's our hope. We define our hope as what we become. But our new hope in Christ focuses on who we become. Our interests are not so much about what I, what, how much I'm acknowledged or respected, honored by others, but so much about how we live our life faithfully in wherever we go and whatever we do. Our priorities of life, our relationships, reflect our faith and integrity in Christ and our love for suffering people. Our hope is not so much about who we choose in life and what we choose in life. It is more about by whom we are chosen. God says to us, I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you no matter what happens to you. That's the promise of God until the end. I'm not going to give up on you forever. That's the promise of God for our life. And we hold on to that promise. Of course, we want, comf- we want a comfortable, comfortable life. We want, we want a happy life. But life always has ups and downs. And it is not important whether we are in ups or downs if we are bound to God. Then we understand the confession of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, which is one of the most misunderstood verses in in the whole Bible. Verse 13 says, I can do all this through him who strengthens me. And Alan says, yes, amen. But you see, this verse is not about a, about a positive thinking or a higher goal in life. In verse 11 and 12, Paul says, I have learned to be content in any and every situation of life, 
whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether living in abundance or in need. I can do all this, which means to be content through him who strengthens me. It's not about, yes, we can do anything, but it's about, yes, we can be content. As far as God is with me. Before I close my sermon, I'd like to tell you one more thing. In verse 41 and 42, we have to think about the meaning of being left behind and being taken away. Many Christians understand these verses as speaking of rapture. Rapture means seized or taken away. There are other Bible verses that are more ambiguous in speaking of rapture, but not this passage. Rapture literally means seized or snatched away. But in verse 40, it says, There are two men working in the field. One of them will be taken away, and, and the other is left behind. In verse 41, there are two women grounding with, hand, with a hand mill, and one of them will be taken away, and the other is left behind. So let me ask you a question. Which one is more fortunate, and which one is doomed? The one who is taken away, or who is left behind? To find the answer, verse 37 is a hint. The coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. So in the story of Noah, you know the story of Noah, right? Who are the fortunate ones? The one who disappeared or snatched away or the one who are left behind? The, one, the ones who are left behind are the ones who are saved. The conclusion of the passage is verse 44. So you, must, you also must be ready because, of the, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Our hope is not to be snatched by God and live somewhere else called the heaven. God's plan is to restore God's creation. God's plan is to save the people from their sins and, and let them fill the earth, praising God's name and experiencing a perfect harmony of the, great, of, the great, of the created world. God already started to carry out God's plan through Christ and invite all of us to join God's great plan. Our response should be sincerely waiting for the arrival of our Lord, even in the midst of confusion and even in the midst of difficulties. We can wait in hope because God is with us. So the most important thing is this, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope is not a, hope is a spiritual muscle, spiritual muscle. Like all muscles, it must be exercised and improved. Otherwise, it will go away. As you get older, it goes, goes away faster. A New Testament scholar, George Ladd, explains how our hope this way. If you have a seed in your hand, but you don't know what it is, you planted it and wait until the seed becomes a tree. And you see uh, one or two small fruits coming out of the tree, but you still don't know what, they, what it is. And the, the fruits, some of the fruits, are ripe enough for you to eat. So you grab one fruit and taste it. Now you know what kind of fruit it will bear, the tree will bear, as it, it bears the full of fruits. Now you know what kind of tree it is. That's the definition of a hope, according to uh, the theologian George Ladd. 
we already know the presence of God. We already know the comfort of God touching our hearts. Because we already taste it. We expect what it's going to be like when the kingdom of God will come to us in full and, and thorough manner. This is the definition of our hope. We don't, follow, we don't chase the rainbows that we never tried, we never tasted. But because we experience God in our hearts and Jesus Christ gives us hope and salvation, then we have expectation that in one day, God will fill the earth with the same, same uh, fruit, fruit of life. This is our hope in Jesus Christ. We believe the kingdom of God will be manifested fully and thoroughly. And we believe that God will vindicate all of us, telling us, you are enough. Yes, you are enough to be called the children of God, which is very opposite from the message we hear from the world. You are not enough for any reason. You are not enough to be loved by others. But God says differently. And this is our hope in Jesus Christ. And this is the promise of God for all the believers who have hope in God. Amen.